So a pleasant good morning again, ladies and gentlemen. Um, welcome to the 17th meeting of the Joint Select Committee on Local Authorities, Service Commissions, and Statutory Authorities, including the THA, in the 12th Parliament. This meeting is being broadcast live on the Parliament channel and is, is also being streamed on the Parliament's YouTube channel, Pal View. Today, we are convening our first public hearing pursuant to our inquiry into the operations of the Environmental Management Authority with specific focus on noise pollution. We are pleased to have before us officials of the Ministry of Planning and Development, the Environmental Management Authority, and the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service. I would like at this stage to ask representatives of the Environmental Management Authority to please introduce yourselves. Uh, good morning, Hayden Romano, our Managing Director of the Environmental Management Authority. Good morning, everyone. Maurice Wishard, Legal Officer Tree in the Environmental Management Authority. Morning, good morning. Janelle Partap, Manager Legal Services at the EME. Good morning. Wien Rajkumar, Manager of Technical Services, Environmental Management Authority. Good morning, everyone. Giselle Joseph, Assistant Manager, Technical Services with the EME. So, morning, members. At this stage, the Ministry of Planning and Development, could you please introduce um, members present? Good morning, Marie Hanks, Acting Permanent Secretary in the Ministry of Planning and Development. Good morning, David Passad, Environmental Manager in the Environmental Policy and Planning Division, Ministry of Planning and Development. Good morning, everyone. Candice Ramsaran, Acting Director, Town and Country Planning Division. The Trinidad and Tobago Police Service, please introduce yourselves. Good morning, Sharon Cooper, Assistant Commissioner of Police, Trinidad and Tobago Police Service. Good morning, I am Collis Hazel, Assistant Commissioner of Police, Trinidad and Tobago Police Service. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. My name is Terence Dick, Inspector of Police, Trinidad and Tobago Police Service. So welcome all and thank you again for being here. And I would like um, to ad ad advise the public here really that, um, th yeah, um, that this inquiry here, my, myself, I'm Dr. Varmadi Alsing, I'm chair of this um, Joint Select Committee, and I'd like my members present to introduce themselves. Morning, everyone. Lawrence Hislop, member. Good morning, everyone. Lisa Morris Julian, member. Yeah. Yeah. And a member, Jayanti Lachmidial, is here, so she'll be stepping in in a moment. So the, the purpose of this inquiry, the objectives really, is to examine the performance and the strategies of the EMA as it pertains to noise pollution management in Trinidad and Tobago. And it's also to determine the challenges which inhibit the application of policies and guidelines regarding noise pollution management in Trinidad and Tobago. And lastly, to determine whether the legislation adequately empowers the EMA to effectively execute its mandate with regard to noise pollution management in Trinidad and Tobago. Now I would like to ask the following persons to give a brief two-minute opening statement, starting with Mr. Hayden Romano. Uh, thank you, Chairman, members. The EMA is pleased to engage with the Joint Select Committee on Local Authorities, Service Commissions, and Statutory Authorities on the issue of noise pollution. These open, opening remarks are made in support of the written responses previously submitted for the attention and review of the committee. Noise pollution is an area of tremendous concern, not just nationally, but indeed regionally and globally. The UN Environment Program 2022 Frontiers Report states that noise pollution in cities 
is a growing hazard to public health. The World Health Organization also reports that noise pollution is the second largest environmental cause of health problems just after the impact of air pollution. At the EMA, noise-related complaints are the number one complaint received via the EMA's hotline. In the last five years, 2018 to 2022, the figures reflect 913 noise-related complaints. This is truly a national issue, especially when we consider the del deleterious effects of noise pollution. According to a 2022 Harvard Medicine report, noise pollution not only drives hearing loss, tinnitus, and hypersensitivity to sound, but can cause an exhibit cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes, sleep disturbances, stress, mental health and cognition problems, including memory um, impairment defects, childhood learning delays, low birth weight, and scientists are investigating other possible links, including to dementia. Therefore, the question that must be complicated, contemplated is what legislation is in place to address noise pollution. The EMA's role in the management of noise pollution is governed by the provisions of the Environmental Management Act and regulated through pieces of subsidiary legislation, which primarily includes the noise pollution control rules. This confines the EMA's remit to noise pollution from events and commercial and industrial sources. The noise pollution rules helpfully sets out the, statu the statutory space that the EMA is mandated to occupy by Rule 24, which states as follows. Nothing in these rules affect the operation of the Summary Offenses Act and the common law regarding nuisance. Accordingly, there's a tripartite legislative trust to treat with noise pollution in Trinidad and Tobago. We have the jurisdiction of the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service under the Summary Offenses Act and other relevant pieces of legislation. We have the right of every citizen to take action against noise pollution under the common law for nuisance. And of course, the EMA's remit to treat with noise pollution from events and commercial and industrial sources. Moreover, Rule 9 of the Noise Pollution Rules provides that where any person proposes to conduct an activity of event that will cause sound in excess of the prescribed standard, that person shall submit an application to the EMA for noise variation. Further, the rules provide that the EMA shall establish conditions for each variation. The conditions included in the variation all speak to attempting to avoid, minimize, or mitigate noise pollution from the activity, including monitoring of the conditions of the primary condition embodied in noise variation relates to the decibel levels to be maintained during the pendency of the activity or event. As previously mentioned, there are multiple pieces of existing legislation which fall under the remit of the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service, which were promulgated to curtail, to curtail the nuisance caused by noise pollution. And these include the Summary Offenses Act, the Fireworks Permit Regulations, the Theaters and Dance Hall Act and Regulations, the Liquor License Act, the Shops, Hours of Opening and Employment Act, the Motor Vehicle and Road Traffic Regulations, the Maxi Taxi Act and the Maxi Taxi Order, and the Registration of Clubs Act. During the COVID-19 pandemic, Trinidad and Tobago instituted the requisite public health measures, which had a collateral effect of significantly diminishing 
the sources of anthropogenic noise pollution in relation to amplified soil. However, following the relaxation of these public health measures and the return to normal, the EMA recorded a concomitant increase in the number of complaints and reports of noise pollution. Accordingly, the EMA considered and isolated the most significant amendment to be made to the rules to deliver more efficient monitoring of important sources of noise pollution. Events that employ the use of amplified sound. A specific amendment was advanced to rule two of the rules to allow the EMA to broaden its impact on the response to the complaints of noise pollution generally and with respect to events that had been granted a noise pollution. Previously, a noise variation. Um, previously, the rules required a three hour monitoring period, and this was reduced to 30 minutes to allow the EME to monitor and respond to, greater, to a greater number of noise complaints and so provide relief to more stakeholders. This amendment became effective in February of 2022. Such monitoring of events is conducted by the EMA's Environmental Policy Unit. The EPU, comprised of Special Reserve Police Officers appointed by the Commissioner of Police and assigned to the EMA, the EPU officers are imbued with the powers and privileges of police officers and are appointed environmental inspectors under the EM Act. The remit of the EMA, however, is not limited to investigating noise pollution, but um, extends to the prosecution of all offenses under the EM Act and its subsidiary legislation. Specific examples include monitoring of events with or without variations, invest investigating noise complaints, serving legal documents, patrolling environmentally sensitive areas, accompanying and accompanying EME officers on site visits for security purposes if and when required. Fireworks are another major cause for concern, and the EMA notes the growing voices to nationally address this issue. The EMA has made its position abundantly clear with the recommendations of its 2021 position paper on the management of fireworks in Trinidad and Tobago. This position paper outlines the damaging effects, impacts of traditional fireworks on human health and the welfare of animals, and a ban on traditional noise producing fireworks has been recommended. And of course, this position paper is available to the committee and can be accessed by the general public on the EMA's website. As I close, Chair, the EMA is encouraged by convening of this JSC with a specific purpose on noise pollution. And we are confident that the discussions embarked upon today will kickstart the much needed national dialogue and an all of society approach that is required to address the scourge of noise pollution. Perhaps from this dialogue, we may see the emergence of a better understanding of the roles and re remit of partner agencies and support from key stakeholders, such as FED promoters, event organizers, bar owners, the general public, and heightened support and collaboration from the TTPS. Thank you for your attention, and we look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Romano. That was very comprehensive, and I think you're making our jobs easier because you answered some questions that we were going to, you know, um, put to you. At this stage, I would like the Permanent Secretary of the Ministry of Planning, Ms. Mary Hines, to please um, give us some opening statements. Good morning again, Chairman and members. After such a comprehensive statement by my colleague, I thought you might have dismissed the entire... Um, I, I was prepared to, to, to head out feeling really good that we got the job done. Notwithstanding, same, uh, we, the Ministry of Planning and Development, we really do thank you for the invitation. 
um, into this inquiry of the operations of the EMA with specific, specific focus on noise pollution. So, as my colleague said, we look forward to the guidance and recommendations that may proceed from this discourse. Mr. Chairman, as you know, as you are well aware, the EMA is responsible for the sustainable management of the natural resources and environment by providing a framework to facilitate policy and decision making in development. In this regard, the Ministry of Planning and Development continues to support the work of the EMA in terms of providing funding for the development of their projects and programs and works synergistically together, particularly through the Environmental Policy Planning Division and the Town and Country Planning Division of the Ministry. As the arm of the government responsible for environmental policy, in keeping with gov government's policy framework for sustainable development, the MPD supports the EME as they function to establish an integrated environmental management system, implement policies and programs to pro promote sustainable development, and enhance the legal and regulatory framework for environmental management. Mr. Chairman, the Ministry of Planning and Development in its efforts to support the EMA's legislative agenda, we do so by reviewing and obtaining the necessary approvals for any new legislation and amendments. The Honorable Minister of Planning and Development signed in February of 2022 the amendment of the Noise Pollution Rules, Rule 2 of the Noise Pollution Control Rules. This amendment, as my colleague shared, reduced the period of continuous monitoring of sound pressure levels from three hours for 30 minutes, thereby making it more effective for the environmental police unit attached to the EMA to monitor multiple events on the same night. We would also like you to note that we facilitate coordination and partnerships between the EMA and other state agencies, such as the IMA, Institute of Marine Affairs, and the Shagaramas Development Authority, in an effort to address environmental concerns. This type of collaboration has commenced through quarterly meetings held by the Minister of Planning and Development with all chairmen, chairmen of statutory bodies that are under our ministry to foster synergies and to provide support and updates on ongoing and new projects and events. Some of the other areas in which the ministry supports the EMA to achieve their mandate include providing administrative support and guidance to the EMA with regards to budgeting, auditing, and organizational restructuring, assisting with the preparation of budget estimates for the public sector investment program, their PSIP proposals, that is, and the release of funds for the operation of the EME. In addition, we provide opportunities for staff to attend international and local training, conferences, and meetings aimed at building capacity as well as establishing networks with institutions. And finally, endorsing the work of the EMA by attending their events at community symposia, workshops, and meetings. So in closing, Chairman and members, I would like to reiterate that the ministry is committed to continue working with the EMA as it pertains to noise management in Trinidad and Tobago. I once again thank you for this opportunity to meet with the committee my team stands ready to provide further information that would assist the committee on our fruitful discussions on this very important inquiry. I thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Ms. Hines. And I, I feel encouraged that your support and quick support of reducing the time from three hours you know, to a, a, a lesser time would have helped you know, the plight of persons waiting, you know, and even your staff to be able to go around the different events. So, we see the synergy, the encouragement, the, the, you know, the co cooperation, and this is welcoming to see. At this stage, I would like Mr. Colin Hazel, the Assistant Commissioner, Northwest um, Police Service, to please give us an um, opening statement. Good morning, members of the committee. Um, the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service is delighted to be part of this inquiry as we look forward to working in collaboration with all the other 
agencies as we address this issue coming out of the EMA. We are mindful and we are noted as well in our various town meetings that we are having that noise pollution has been an issue and continue to be an issue on the nation's agenda of the population. And therefore, we are confident that with the discussion and on what will take place here today, the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service is quite prepared in working with other collaborative agency to see a mitigation of this problem which exists in society today. I thank you. Thank you, Mr. Collis Hazel. I guess um, so. The three major stakeholders are here this morning to see if we can, ass, you know, assist each other, and we, as the members of the committee, could um, make suggestions that could help um, our citizens against the, um, the the effects of noise pollution. I would like to remind um, both committee members and officials to direct their questions and concerns through the chair. And I would like to remind members and officials to kindly activate your microphone on your devices when they are acknowledged by the chair and turn it off when they have concluded their contributions. So I am very heartened to hear the, the effects and the, the Mr. Mara, uh, Romano's um, you know, whole idea that he gave a comprehensive idea about the issues facing, he, you mentioned the UN report, you mentioned medical reports, you have gone and even um, you know, told us about the fact that um, there was improvements, as I mentioned before, from the three years to um, the period now that you're looking to help and appease the public. So I, I, I must commend you for that, and I must say that um, um, we all appreciate the, your comments made by, for, by the UN and WHO concerning the health risk of noise pollution. So as I want to come in with a little opening statement, I must um, um, mention that our member is here, Ms. Amin is here, Khadija Amin, so she has joined our team here as well this morning. So noise pollution is a nuisance to any civilized society. It is a public health hazard, as you mentioned, Mr. Romano. It is also and it, it, it is not just the hearing its effect. It, it has this uh, physiological effect and changes, as you mentioned, high blood pressure, uh, cardiovascular disease, stroke, insomnia, diabetes, which is high in our population. The Minister of Health has, has been trying to uh, control this chronic disease. And noise pollution is one of the factors that we can probably help him if we can reduce this. So then, besides the health and, and the mental health effects of health, I'm a psychiatrist. So I am totally um, in agreement with what you read that, you know, depression. I had patients who were depressed trying to sleep, and they could not sleep, and they, they, their illness got worse. People with anxiety, post-traumatic stress. So all these things are very important. So we are here this morning to look at the medical benefits, not just the hearing problems, because I think, um, um, I, Hearing disability, a global disability, I think um, it's the fourth leading cause of um, disabilities. So it's, it's something that we have to look at here. So it not only affects health, it also affects educational um, aspects uh, or, or, uh, of our achievement of our children. There was a 1974 study in New York where they looked at a school and on the east side of the school, there was a train line running. Every four and a half minutes, a train would, would run and for 30 seconds. And they compared the children on the east side to the west side, which had no noise. And they actually found that there was a, a, those children um, who were not exposed to the noise, they were better achievers. So they were, they were, they were, they were better achievers. They did better in tests and reading skills. So this was a study, a whole study. But it, it, it comes to the point that is not just health, it looks at the education of our children. And other studies have proved that. But besides health and besides education, in the United States, they looked at certain areas and they found that it's, it's an environmental justice issue. So, so we here today are looking at issues that are very important, where they, they found that the burden of noise was not shared equally across the population. The study looked at certain population, they said the lower income population and the minority groups 
they're exposed to more noise levels, be it the roads, be there more industries, and even where they're living in houses that are closer to each other. So it's an environmental justice issue that we also have to look at. So again, um, environmental noise um, would have to be addressed also from this level because it, it also would have prevented these um, impoverished individuals from not getting their full potential because if you are now have disrupted learning, if it's going to affect your academic studies, we may be encouraging a cycle of poverty that exists if those people are exposed to noise. So it's, it's important that we understand that we have to get these people to escape from that and any situ anything we could help them get out of this um, would be beneficial. So noise also affects wildlife and I'm so happy the PS mentioned your, uh, your leanings with the IMA, your cooperation, because we know sound in the ocean affects whales, po uh, uh, the, 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 the dolphins, they, they're the main um, communication means. So the mating effects is, is down. Shrimp activity, activity in coral reefs. So all those are issues that would be affected in noise in the ocean. So the IMA has a part to play because we found that even the um, ships that are coming in, the propellers, all of these are issues that we have to now address what's going on in the ocean because the whole ecosystem could be affected by this. And, and certain countries like Germany have recognized this and tried to actually decrease the uh, acoustic footprint, which is what we will also be trying to achieve. So I think I've laid the groundwork and I've heard what you, um, Mr. Romano, had said, that we can use this committee and the recommendations to assist citizens. And I think um, we know even though um, you mentioned there were about, uh, there are a lot of complaints. Your major complaints in, in, in is noise pollution. So you, we realize now we have to keep up with that and give citizens who are crying out some sort of relief. And this, I think, is what we will be looking to go into. So my first question, I would like to make this question, uh, direct this question to the Environmental Management Authority's team. And for the benefit of the public, can you tell us again about the the, um, the you, you had mentioned it, Mr. Romano, but for the viewing public, the main roles and responsibilities of the EMA and the role and responsibilities of the EMA as it relates to noise control and noise pollution. <clears throat> so the EMA, um, the Environmental Management Authority, which is established in 1995, and the act was repealed and, and, and replaced in 2000. And um, the, 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 when the EMA was established, and, and we had both sides of the house, so all sides of the house, I mean, agreeing to the establishment of this Environmental Management Authority, because our legislators at the time saw the impact importance of the environment um, with respect to development. And this authority was established not only to coordinate environmental functions, not only to, to build public uh, awareness and, and do sensitization sessions, public education sessions with respect to the environment, but also to put in place the regulatory uh, framework. So we are regulator. And, um, and the regulatory framework consists of a number of pieces of su uh, subsidiary legislation. And included in this legislation would be the CEC rules, the um, water pollution rules, the noise pollution rules, the air pollution rules, uh, the waste um, rules, the environmentally sensitive areas, and the environmentally sensitive species rules. So all these rules are what the EMA use to, 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 um, to, to regulate the environmental impact of development, really to, 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 to try as much as possible that to, to have sustainable development in Trinidad and Tobago. We do this in accordance with all policies in Trinidad and Tobago, including Trinidad and Tobago's national environmental policy and, and the EMA's role in the developing Trinidad and Tobago's 
um, national environmental policy is as facilitator. So we facilitate the development of the policy, and the most recent policy was done in 2018 and laid in Parliament, I think, somewhere in maybe um, November of, of, of 2018. So with respect to noise pollution, um, which is where we, we sit today and, 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 and which is the inquiry is focusing on, the EMA's remit is with respect to events where persons having events and want to, to make sound above the prescribed levels. And there is a daytime level and there is a nighttime level. And if you want to make sound above that level, you're required to apply to the EME for a noise variation. And there is a process to apply for it. It's, I mean, you have to make the application at least 30 days before the event, which gives the public, the major stakeholders, the opportunity to know of the event and to put in any uh, um, um, objections that they may have to the, um, have to the event, um, to, uh, to, uh, with the event taking place. And from that, the EME will craft a noise variation. I think it's important for us to recognize that a noise variation in no way gives you approval to hold the event. It is not an approval to have an event. It's an approval to make sound above the prescribed levels identified in the noise pollution control rules. In instances where, where you don't have a noise variation, it means that your event can take place, but it must be in compliance with the noise pollution control rules, and the EME will monitor and of course, we will uh, um, advise you if you're above the levels for you to turn down the sound. Um, I don't know if I've missed anything. I don't know if any no, of them no, have missed Very comprehensive. And, and I'm happy that you mentioned that people have to apply 30 days before. Um, OK, I'm, I'm corrected, 35. 35, OK. So but sometimes somebody may have an event and the people may not see it in the newspaper. Is there a, a way that, um, let's say you're going to have an event in a, a residential area, a house. Is there a way to get the public around that area, the neighborhood, the residents, to know there's going to be an event that we could probably suggest some signage or some sort of, a, uh, you know, that could see that this event will be held here and a, a noise variation. Instead of just the newspapers, where people may miss it. Is it it's something that we could really, you know, not wait until an event is held and people not able to object to it? Yeah. Chairman, so we've recently, I mean, asked, I mean, requested an increase in the size of the ad so that people are seeing it clearer in the newspapers. But as part of the process, once you make an application, one of the, 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 the things that you have to do and come back to the EME with is that you have to distribute flyers, advise all your neighbors that this event is taking place, and the neighbors with, I mean, and the neighbors have to sign something to say that you spoke with them. And then you come back to us with um, demonstrating that you have informed the stakeholders in your community that this event is taking place. So that is actually an, uh, um, one of the, the requirements before you get the variation. OK. Let's say the neighbors are, are going to be held. Is it the, the, do you have an area zone? Because you see, you can just go on that street in front, but two streets behind it get in that noise. Do you have like a, a area that you can say you have to go a certain um, area because you see some people may be left out behind an event and so that's one question the second question do you use social media also to to you know to say that an event is going to be cut um, planned at this event if people have objections yeah. Ch chairman i'm going to ask giselle joseph who is more intimate with with the actual um granting of the variations that to, to, to give you some more details thank you very much mr romano and then, of course through you chair 
um, just to clarify that the request for engagement happens based on a condition included in the variation. And what we do is we actually specify the zone within which you need to um, distribute the flyers and, and whatnot. We specify the actual streets, we specify the distance um, within those, the, the um, venue, the location of the venue that they have to engage the members of the public. So that is all stipulated in the variation. And um, that it's the same radius that we would use in terms of when we are processing the actual variation, who we need to consider, who are the sensitive receptors located in proximity. And what about social media now? So at um, least you give us an idea that the, 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 there's the, the area, social media. Do you use social media? Because some members of the public may claim that the print is too small in the newspaper. So. No, that's not something, because it's not stipulated in the legislation, it's not something we, um, we specify at this time. We do have um, in our proposed detail amendments um, additional measures. So um, prior to you submitting an application, um, a more comprehensive way of engaging the public um, notices, not just in the papers, but also the same type of flyer notices going out prior to um, you submitting the application, et cetera. Also the EMA um, posting as well officially um, within the um, space, of course, for, um, with respect to the legislation for a prescribed fee. But um, we recognize that that was an issue that needed to be addressed and we are now dealing with it through proposed detailed amendments. So we're looking at probably signage by the event, social media to social, expand it. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, Member Amin has a question. Yeah, Chairman, thank you very much. Um, good morning to all. Um, you know, we talk so much about legislation and what the legislation requires. But the public wants to know about action. When you have an event that is loud, what are the measures for enforcement? You mentioned that you can measure the sound to see if it passes the, what you give them approval for the variation. The practical reality is that there are events, one-off events, or spaces within residential areas, as well as built-up areas, that continuously have high levels of noise. And numerous complaints come to the EMA, to the police, and there seems to be no action in terms of a reduction in the noise or enforcement. And I am saying this as a representative who has numerous letters in the EMA and the police for spaces that were once residential, but now seems to be a regular occurrence, so you have parties. I'll mention in Valsin South, in Trin City, those are residential areas. But they have little upscale parties and the noise disturbs the residents and it happens continuously. You have areas such as, let's say, Kirap and so on, where you do have bars and it's recognized as a commercial center, but certainly there must be some sort of discretion for the duration of the noise beyond, let's say, 11 p.m. or midnight. There must be a stipulated time. And then who goes out there, beside the MP and the councillor, who they call in on our phone? Who goes out to ensure that the noise is not just low down when the police pass, but that it stays down? And that if the noise level go up after the police pass, that there is some sort of penalty for these agencies? That is my question to you. It's one question, yeah, but... Um. Chairman, through you, and, and, and yes, we understand because we are in the, 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 the battlefield with respect to noise and enforcement. With respect to our legislation, this is the EMA legislation under the EM Act. The, we, it is clear what the EMA can do. And what the EMA can do in terms of its powers is really um, requests the, the, the perpetrator to turn down the music. And if that doesn't happen, you would, we would register that you are in breach of an environmental requirement, and we go through the process 
of doing uh, uh, a request for enforcement and then a notice of violation, which we serve on you, which will be after the event. And of course, I mean, there might be a fine or something like that. But the, the, the challenge with that is that it's not immediate relief. However, and, and this is where I have to be very careful, and I will go to my lawyers in a little while. Um, there are our environmental police officers are police officers with police powers. And if we look at nuisance, this is a nuisance. And, and, and therefore, the police powers should be able to use to shut down these events. There is an active, my lawyers tell me to be very careful, we have an active case now because we lost in the high court. It's now in the appeal court. And I'm told I must just not say anything about it because hopefully we will have a decision soon from the appeal court, not only with respect to the powers of the EME, but the powers of the police with respect to um, noise. Uh, um, lawyers, am I, am I, am I right? Yes. <laughs> right? Um, Chairman, I, I am aware of the case because I have been told that this is one of the reasons your enforcement has a little hurdle at this time, where there's a toss up in terms of who is responsible for enforcement. But there is the perception, even before this case became, before the court, that you know, the EMA ha is not, does not have the teeth to shut down events or even to regulate noise, in, especially in residential areas. That, that is if you and then where does the police come in and how perhaps can the police assist? Because apart from the noise, it is a nuisance. Right, it, it, there is a nuisance. So even if you measure, you use your instrument and you measure, how can the TTPS move in in terms of enforcement while this case going on in, in the court? Chair, maybe the TTA, TTPS could help us here. Yeah. Uh? yeah, sure, if you had any, if you have any suggestions how you may Proceed. Um, Chair, um, through you, Terence Dick, Inspector of Police. Um, what I remember, we still at the same point I'm raised because even our powers are scrutinized in that said um, case. And because the case was decided the way it was, the status quo remains. And as the status quo remains, we are statute of, we are creatures of statute, and because we are creatures of statute, our powers are enshrined in that statute. And we all know that those powers, um, as you say you were, as you are, you are aware of the case, you would have seen how the court went through that. So it would be difficult to even comment based on what happened there. All I, we can I appreciate, do, because the subject yes, is correct, we, correct. we want to go in there. But our function here today is to give you all the teeth to, via the legislation. So we can now look at different ways that we can, um, recommendations or suggestions also, eh, which hope, yeah, which will come out of this. So we would need some recommendation. Now, now you mentioned also that you go into a place and it's after the event that you would now um, be able to give that uh, fine. And, and, and the members of the public may not like that. Eh? They will say that they are still bombarded with the noise. So we'll have to get a way that you can work in tandem with the police officers. Now let's look at a bar. Let's, you, let's say you, you, you see a noisy bar in a town. You're going down the road, music is, is, is hitting, and people with dementia get more confused eh, with that noise. Remember, there's a baseline noise also. Is there a way that we can formulate a ticketing system? Like how you, know, you have vehicles now, you can ticket them for defective. A ticketing system which will save time from the police officers having to go to court where um, once you can go in with your, your, your meter and you know, it's above a certain area, it's easier to get our tickets. And also a fact that with not just tickets, but if somebody is now breaching it a few times, you take away the license of the bar. Is that something you would be willing to put in any sort of consideration? So is it a good idea? Uh, Mr. Chairman, just to add to what the managing director said, uh, I noticed you mentioned uh, 
bars in residential areas. Yeah. Uh, from the outset, we must contemplate whether or not that location is allowed. So immediately we bring into focus the planning aspect of the whole thing. So what we will try to do fundamentally is to make sure that in all the circumstances we don't impose, as the member said through you, about uh, specific locations within residential areas. In addition to that, every single bar would have to have a license. They will go to the licensing committee and they will have their licenses determined. There have been instances where loud music and other activities have resulted in the revocation of licenses or the annotation of certain things on licenses. I think officers above the rank of, ser uh, of sergeant can request the licenses from the bars and make certain annotations that are brought to the attention of the licensing committee upon renewal of those licenses. So if the license is not granted or the licenses are granted subject to conditions, then we can see automatically we have some kind of abatement in that regard. So what we want to do fundamentally from the outset is to eliminate instances of those pockets of uh, noise in residential areas from a planning perspective. In instances where we've done so, then we go towards the licensing requirement itself. So this would attack fundamentally the ability of the bar to actually operate. And there have been instances of this happening and instances of the licensing committee acting according to information received from investigating police officers and so on. Coming back to the EMA's role, when the EMA finds that there have been, there's been a breach of an environmental requirement, and that is always couched in the legislation, the EMA issues what you call a notice of violation, for short, an NOV. The so-called violators given this notice they had the, the natural justice requirement to actually reply to the EMA in what we call a representation meeting accompanied by any advisor. The EMA considers all the circumstances and if the matter can be satisfactorily resolved between the parties, something called a consent agreement can be entered into with the EMA and the so-called violator. Now that agreement points the violator specifically to do all the necessary things to make sure that does not reoccur. So once the EMA grabs you with that notice of violation, it's not a mere fine only. So we point you towards the requirement of getting a variation, and that variation has within it measures, some of it has been discussed previously, which allows for the mitigation of sound, the arrangement of speakers, decibel levels, notification of, of the surrounding sensitive receptors and so forth. So I see what you're saying. When you're planning a, 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 a bar or some noise um, emanating business, you have to come into the EMA and get that sort of a, um, commission, know where to put your um, equipment. But what I'm thinking, let's say you have, you're going down the street and there's a guy with a, a box with speakers just making noise. Is it a simple way you could just go with a meter and say I'm three feet away from this guy or five feet away and the level of the meter reads high, a certain level above you know, the danger level, that you can now give him a ticket. Is that a feasible thing? Not looking at bar uh, areas. Because even if a bar is open and you can go in there and just get a reading from a certain distance, I think a ticketing system may, you know, persons have to pay the money out, you know, and then you could negotiate after. And, um, you know, so I'm looking at, is there a way that you can get that into your plans? Right. So in terms of the ticketing system, which is already established in a certain way, and only specific people can issue those tickets, right, that is a very good idea. It can happen, but it can only happen through the auspices of the TTPS. This cannot be something that the EMA undertakes. 
in terms of the measurement that the EMA does, this occurs from the property boundary line of the source of the sound. So the intention was to put the EME to deal with premises that we issue CCs and other clearances to, and events from, that have amplified sound. So there is that tripartite uh, coinage in the legislation that Mr. Romano spoke about, which allows for the operation of the Summary Offenses Act expressly, the EMA's remit, and also the ability of anyone to personally undertake under the common law. Normally, you would come outside the property on the boundary and make that determination about the noise. So the individual in the street make a noise with a box or something. How, how do you, how would you, uh, we, oh yeah, how do you tackle that? You have a distance to say, well, you know, you come, it, he's making himself a nuisance. How would you um, put that into any sort of legislation if it doesn't exist? Um, Mr. Chair, through you, that, that is the remit of the TTPS. Yeah. Lush Medial, I think you have a question for us. Thank you, Chair. I have a couple questions, actually. Um, so I understand some of the challenges you all have with enforcement, given the matter which is subjudice um, and being considered currently by the Court of Appeal. Now, whilst enforcement may be a challenge, what about being a little more circumscribed in terms of um, where we allow events and we allow variations? Um, MP, I mean, we've spoken about her area. Let me talk to you about my area. I live, I could see Sapa, Skinner Park from where I live. Whether I wanted to enjoy carnival or not, I was forced to enjoy it. And I do enjoy carnival, let me say that up front. But if I choose not to attend a particular event, I would like to not feel like it's in my living room. But I do feel like they are in my living room. I call TTPS about 100 times, you can check San Fernando Police Station, absolutely zero assistance, none whatsoever. And I live in a residential area, a traditional residential area. So what we have happening, for example, and I'll speak specifically about San Fernando, we have something that was supposed to be a performance arts center, which has now turned into a pet car park, because car, the Sapa car park is hosting fets, and the music is very loud. You all spoke about sensitive receptors. There are two homes for the aged very close to Sapa as in walking distance from Sapa, you have one run by the Catholic Church and one run by the Presbyterian Church, very close proximity to that. How is it that noise variations and licenses and permissions are granted to have these events with these sensitive receptors and so on within um, you know, distance of, of um, residential areas and so on? Isn't there, I mean, if you cannot physically be there to, and I'll get to that later on, but if you can't physically be there to monitor every single event and to check decibel levels and so on, because I'm talking about at three o'clock in the morning, the, the burglar profit in my house is still vibrating from noise. How is it then that, you know, wouldn't it make more sense to be, to, to take front, as we say, and just not permit these types of events? Because enforcement is a challenge as, as it stands right now. Don't we have to do and be a little more careful with where we allow these events to take place, knowing full well that we have a challenge with enforcement, knowing that it's, it's almost impossible to go in and shut down something right now, pending the outcome of a court matter and so on. I mean, what, doesn't the EMA do, are you all doing site visits? Are you all ensuring, you used to talk about flyers being passed out. I've never in all my years of living in, in, within the city seen a flyer about a proposed variation, and almost every weekend. You ever see a flyer? Right. Yeah, I've never seen a flyer. And I could tell you, every weekend, I hear noise. If it's not from the South Trunk Road side, it's from the other side, <laughs> All right? So I've never seen a flyer. So perhaps before, what sort of groundwork is the EMA doing before you allow these variations? So that's my first thing. The second thing is that if it is that you have this notice of violation being issued to someone or you get a number of reports uh, about a specific event, is that counted against the record of the person? So, for example, when they apply that same promoter or that same 
um, organizer or whoever it is, if they apply for a future variation, do you take into account how many complaints and reports you've had about previous events that they've had? Because if the same person is coming over and over and over to apply for variations to hold different events, um, or some of them in the same location, because some of these things are annual or biannual or, or um, events, and every time they have an event, you get a complaint, which you can't treat with because of either manpower issues or the law or whatever it is. Are you making a record of those things? And my third question is, and we had the TTPS in another committee recently where it was asked, and I'm sure you saw it in the newspaper, because promoters are complaining about the high cost of police at extra duty for events. If you have police at an event, um, they're not just there to break up fight and make sure Mando Pell bottle and thing, but can't they also um, ensure that the noise levels are within the parameters that are set and that there's some sort of um, compliance with the rules set out? I see a problem here with silos because I'm hearing about people having things to check decibel levels and so on belonging to the EMA, but the people who could actually enforce it being the TTPS, and unless the two of you all partner up and, and are there together, then clearly somebody has to shift the authority to somebody else because it's hard enough to get one agency to do its job in this country, far less to get two. And I think that's a serious problem. Now, I will tell you this. I am one of those people who monitor those public publications in the newspaper, and I call EMA very regularly to complain about the locations of some um, events. And I'm regularly told, well, you know, we don't have enough officers to send out to test the decibel, well, um, decibel levels for enforcement and so on. Are you not, or has it not entered into discussions or, or you know, in anybody's contemplation that it would be more useful for the police to be equipped to test the decibel level, seeing that they're already there and that they have to be there at the event in, a, in any case? Um, isn't that something that, that should be considered or has been considered or have you all at least tried to implement in some way? So those are my, my three um, big you know, areas that I would like to hear from both CTPS and EME on. Uh, Chairman, uh, thank you, thank you very, uh, very much, uh, Member. I will start, and I'll get the the, the, the experts to, to, to fill in. Um, so, one, the, the EMA is not approving any event or approving any venue for an event. The EMA is approving sound above the prescribed levels. Stick so, up in. Sorry. But if you don't approve the sound above the approved level, the event can't happen, not so? No, the event it can, can happen, happen mm -hmm. but you must be in compliance with the noise pollution rules, which, and, which is, so it means between 8 in the morning and 8 in the evening, you can go up to 80, 80 decibels, and from 8 in the evening, to eight in the morning, you have to go down to 65 decibels. So you can have your event, but it has to be at 65 decibels. So the EMA doesn't, we, so we can't stop an event because you will go and get your bar license and whatever else. Got you, okay. But, but sorry, through you, Chair. But if you apply for a variation, at a specific, you have to say where, where the location is, right? Yes. And you all have the power to deny the variation at that particular, yes. right? Can't say no to the variation. In which case they would act either have to keep it under 65 in the evening yes. or, be in, yeah. or, or violate the law. Correct. Right, okay. So, so I'm happy you, 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 you brought that up because we, if there are complaints against a venue, and remember, it's the venue, so it doesn't matter with the promoter. A number of things will happen. We may lower the decibel level, so maybe if we had given you approval to be at 85 decibels, we might reduce it to 80 decibels or 75 decibels based on the complaint. One. Two, some venues have been asked to post bonds um, so that, you know, um, because they, they went through an enforcement process and they were above the, the, the decibel levels, and we will monitor once we have significant complaints about a venue. We will monitor. monitor. Hence the importance of members of the public 
building our database with respect to complaints. Um, so that is always Chair, a challenge. Chairman, with all due respect, I don't think there's a shortage of complaints from the public at all. <laughs> the public has been doing their part in terms of putting forward complaints. The question is what happens after the numerous complaints? What teeth does the EMA, the TTPS, or any authority in this country has to deal with noise pollution and especially where you have it can be happening over a period of time continuously, saying that you know you be given allowing them to have something over 85 decibels. 70 decibels is like your hair dryer, right? A blow dryer. Louder than that, you should not be hearing it in the road. Okay, what happens next? I have in Trinity, I have Star House Entertainment for years having events. Every so often you see numerous cars and the residents are up every night. And you are telling me for years they have been complaining. They have been calling the police, they've been calling the EMA, and this is in Trin City, Orange Grove, Trin City area, Takarikwa area, and they have had no redress. Years, even before I became MP. There are numerous places in Valsain, for instance, where it's residential, but they often throw parties. Now, it's, if it's a one-off event, they might be courteous and inform the neighbors. But there is no handbill circulated in the community. There is nothing in your mailbox to say, hey, up the road having an event, so that you could either take precautions or make an objection. It is while the event is going on, and the disturbance, and old people can't sleep, and people with heart problems, you know, calling and complaining, that is when the complaints come. But these instances have been happening for years. As soon as the COVID pandemic, um, the lockdown lifted, in Curep and so those areas, the complaints that come to me, where these bars, they're trying to make up for their lost income, so they're having all these events. And by Lamos, every night. <laughs> and you cannot get any kind of action to at least lower. We don't want to stop them from earning an income. Um, and generating revenue, but we must be reasonable. And so we have been at, I mean, at pain to try to get to where does the enforcement take place. I understand you register complaints, you, you take a record, but who gets law and order in this thing, man? I get it. As, so I, I'm starting I, I to feel like this, the public here, totally frustrated. Yeah, this comes to my, my last question about whether or not these, the, the, when you talk about building your database, um, does the EMA consider the number of complaints against a specific applicant when you're considering a future variation, um, firstly? Because perhaps if people aren't um, getting their variation based on past infractions, that may encourage them to comply. Um, I know it's not much, but it's, it's a bit limited. The other thing is, I don't know if you all would have this information um, or if you would have participated in any way, but in terms of persons losing licenses for commercial premises, bars, restaurants, whatever it is, um, based on complaints about noise, do you have any information about how many licenses or are you consulted in the process of when people make objections to bar licenses um, at the magistrate's court um, so that you participate in these proceedings? Because I've sat through many licensing sessions at magistrate's courts, and I've never seen or heard of, of or from the EMA, um, and I just see the police and say, no objection. <laughs> so I would like to know if, um, if you think perhaps the EMA should be involved in that process, and if you have any information on licenses being revoked, because Correct. of noise specifically. Just to clarify that specific issue, I know my colleague will speak on the variation process subsequently. The police officer is the only person with the local standi to investigate and report back to the licensing committee on the licensing. Now, he can consult any number of people. He has that discretion to consult the EMA, gather information, contact his colleagues in the EPU unit, because as you know, the EPU is staffed with police officers, right? So he has a wide ambit to consult and to report back to the uh, licensing committee and see what the objections are and what his investigations show. 
And the answer is no. So what I'm trying to get at, your unit has the SRP officers, and, but those officers can stop an event. Office, sorry, yeah. that is the matter that is before the, the, the courts. Okay, okay, so then. But they are fully, mm -hmm. they are full police officers. Okay. They have all the authority mm -hmm. of police officers. Mm -hmm. so, so therefore you are highly dependent now from the, for the officers now in the station itself to come on board and stop an event if that is so. Is it, if we are going to change legislation, do you think there's a, there's, there's a, a room for like a, just how they have traffic wardens and noise warden or, or, or somebody who could now go with this meter and have a fine, a, a real time saying that, okay, you now exceeded that limit, this you're going to, to yeah, you're going to get a ticket. So this is something we could look at in the future. Yeah, yeah but yeah. We are and we are supporting you with that. I yeah, mean, okay. we, we agree. I mean, the magnitude of the problem. problem. I, yeah. I mean, we need something different. So we're looking at solutions. But you see, um, um, Mr. Romano, you mentioned that the daytime and the nighttime um, for the, uh, like if they're having a party, what's the decibels you're telling me about? Uh, uh -huh. 65, uh -huh. sorry, 80 for daytime, uh -huh. 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Mm -hmm. And 65 are uh, nighttime, mm -hmm. um, 8 p.m. to 8 a.m. 8 a.m. Because why I'm asking this, we, you remember the WHO had given guidelines. Eh? The WHO for the last, um, I think is they have given good guidelines in terms of the noise level, and they had recently um, decreased the, stress, the threshold. So if they're decreasing that threshold, and now I think they, they mentioned that um, the correct, you know, that no more than 55 decibel noise should be there, and you know you may have background city noise as 55 to 67, but anything greater than 65 can cause the physiological effects that you mentioned. So when I'm looking at these figures of 80 and 65, I know we have a culture of noise in Trinidad, a fetid culture, but I want to just read this because we are now looking at what these members are saying um, according to what they are seeing in the, in, in the, uh, uh, the neighbors and also your constituents. But the Trinidad and Tobago Promoters Association, we wrote to them, and um, we asked them what recommendations um, you know, that, they, that they would want. And they actually found that the decibel level was too low. So they say the standard permitted decibel level of 65, night time, um, 8 p.m. to 8 a.m. are generally too low for the enjoyment expectation of music industry. So we have to, you know, we have to probably um, know how we are going to move in the empowering citizens who seem helpless and knocking on doors and not giving up, getting um, any sort of um, objective. So I think, uh, yeah, so one thing. So I think right now we are looking at, we made that issue, we made the issue of not um, having something in a more a format, not just with flyers, but probably, as I say, something that people will say, an event is going to be hosted that they say. We have to get a, a better way of getting the residents around there or the neighbors to be involved. So we have to look at that. Um, Member Hislop. Thank you, Chairman. Um, Chairman, my, my, my biggest concern right now is, is where we are to the decibel levels in terms of the, the time. Um, when promoters or organizers apply for a variation, what is the standard decibel level that they're looking at for an event? Uh, uh, they don't look at a standard. We know what the prescribed level is, which is 65 in the evening and, and, and during the night and, and, and 80 in the day. And we will give you what decibel level you are allowed. Uh, what Giselle, is, what Giselle, you want to, you Giselle, you want to help me out? <laughs> Um, yes. Um, so again, through you, Chair, um, when we issue variations, it must be um, stressed that the variation is not just a piece of paper saying make how much noise you want. We actually have stipulated levels. We have stipulated durations. We don't ever go above 85, recognizing that um, WHO standards in terms of exposure over an eight-hour period recommends 80 decibels as the max. So um, in order to issue a variation, we only give five above the decibel. What we do for the nighttime 
is we actually look at calculations um, using the inverse square law um, as a way of estimating how would the noise dissipate if we want it to be at the standard. So if we want it to be 65 at the nearest receptor, what would we be able to, to um, grant at the property boundary? And we do those calculations. Um, typically, for nighttime, we don't go over 75 decibels. We also, in terms of duration, we don't grant variations past 2 a.m. Um, for breakfast parties, we don't start any variation before 6 a.m., even though they may apply for something starting at 3. Um, so those are the types of restrictions that we actually stipulate in the variations that we issue. So, so Chairman, just a follow-up. Um, in my, my cursory investigation here, so if I'm, if I'm to, to understand, you don't give above more than five above what is the stipulated? No, we don't give uh, more than five above the daytime limit, which right. is 80, 80 which is so 85. up to 85. For nighttime, we can go as high as 75, depending on, as I said, the calculations that we do using the inverse square law. Right, so g give me an example, based on, on the little information I have in front of me, give me an example of what when you say 65 or 85 decibels, okay. what is an example of okay. that? Okay, so the, if, if you, if you to, be, to remind, the standards specified in the noise pollution control rules are 80 for daytime and 65 for nighttime. It means you don't need any permission if you are operating at 80 or less right, during the daytime. And in the night time... Yeah, what does 80 sound like? I, I don't want to sound like I'm badgering you, but what does 80 sound like, Mr. Chairman? Yes. Or, or what, does, what does 85 80, sound like? 80 can actually, in some, in some cases, um, you can get traffic being at 80 decibels. So, you know, background noise, depending on where you are, if you're in a high traffic area in the heart of the city, right. you know, you can get 80 decibels. So could we safely say... Mm -hmm. that every fit that takes place in Trinidad and Tobago is above the stipulated guidelines? Not in terms of what is measured by the law, because remember, we are measuring, we are measuring for a specific time period, utilizing a specific method. So if you have to, so the, the standard is based on what we call the um, equivalent level over a 30-minute 30, 30 period. So I can monitor you for 30 minutes, and during that 30 minutes, the average must be um, either 80 or less, or 65 or less. So we can monitor you for 30 minutes and record uh, a level that is either 80 or less, depending on the event, depending on how they have, you know, managed the noise levels, et cetera. And we have, so and we have, we have measured uh, uh, events within the actual. No, this is when that's we when it's actually, being measured. When it's being measured, right. exactly. <laughs> so, un, and unless unless we can do that for the entirety of the event, there's no way for us to prove that someone has gone above that, um, based right. on what we. Because of course we have to present the the evidence, which right. is the the monitoring level. Well, well, let's just be fair. Yes. Let's just be fair. Um, my ears, your ears, the, the population's ears are not decibel meters. But if, if, if I am living three streets from an event, and I feel, as my member, as my fellow member, feels like her burglar proofing is coming out of its, of its foundation, that is clearly above 65 or 85 decibels. It, it, may not, it may not be when you are recording, when, when, when officers go to record, the DJ may Correct. turn it down to 65 or 85. Correct. But clearly, a FET is not. We, let, let's just be honest with ourselves. Clearly, well, realistically, a FET doesn't normally run at 65 or 85 decibels. Because if 85 decibels is street noise, because I'm seeing here that hammering a nail could get you up to 125 decibels. 
Yeah, between 120 to 150. The instantaneous peak levels, yes. Right, that's Hammer in a Kneel. Right. So. And so rock concerts are 120, 140. So yeah. I, I understand, we understand the limitations of the EMA. Yes. But we, when we're being realistic, when we're dealing with citizens and with the, the nation, you have to understand that 65, 85 is not what a FET runs at, Mr. Chairman. Uh, but Chair, through you, let's, let's be clear. Uh, within the, the confines of the event, the sound levels will be different depending on the proper placement of speakers to what happens on the uh, fence lines and, and, and further back. So it is, it is two different things. So within the venue, I mean, it might be over 85. But what we are doing in terms of the variation is actually plotting out what it will be at the fence line and, and therefore to mitigate against sound levels. I mean, and we have been successful. You have events at, at various venues where you have lots of complaints, and we're talking about major venues here, um, Brian Lara in South, um, Queen's Park Oval in, in North, Hazley Crawford in North, St. Mary's Grounds in North. You have events where you have no complaints. Uh, so it means the promoters were compliant with respect to how they set up their speakers. It's, an, it's actually a science in terms of setting up the speakers. Whereas there are other events which did not benefit from the science and of course, the, the decibel levels were, were, were ridiculous. So I, I think, yes, we have a challenge, but there, are, there, there is, once the science is employed, you can have events and really not disturb your neighbors. I just wanna follow up from what um, member Hislop was asking about, and you mentioned about the consistent testing over a period of, well, it, I think it's 30 minutes now. Minutes. Right. Again, let's be realistic. You're not going to, even from, you now there's a whole highway between some of these venues that I spoke about and where I live, right? So it's not that I'm talking about inside the venue, I'm talking about very far from the venue. But you're not going to get 30 minutes of consistent noise. I think everybody in this room has been to a FET. Music goes on and off, the DJ talking in between and that kind of thing. And if you are going to measure from whatever distance and expect to get 30 minutes of consistent noise over the 80 decibel level, that's just not going to happen. So as far as I'm sitting here and I'm listening to you all describing all your processes and testing and all that, and the only word that I'm very sorry that I could come up with to describe it is useless. Because I cannot see how you will ever achieve anything if you have to meet those standards. And perhaps it's a challenge that you have, I don't know, but it sounds to me like you will never really find anybody or be able to justify taking action if that's the, pro if that's the, the um, process that you have to go through and the, 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 the evidential um, threshold that you have to meet in order to take action. It just doesn't seem practical. So some sort of recommendation, I think, has to be made um, that, that it can't be that you have to test for this over this period of time and, you know, um, taking into account all of these things before you can do something to, you know, um, impose some penalty or something on, on persons who go above the decibel limit. It's very challenging, I think, even for 30 minutes. And I, I understand it was three hours before. Well, that was probably most impossible. But to get that, um, that consistent if it has to be consistent noise over the 80 decibel level for a period of 30 minutes, I can't see that any party in Trinidad and Tobago you can go to and have that being done and, and that you will be able to achieve that threshold. So I don't know what's your view on that and if the measuring, um, the type of measurement you do, if there's something that you've looked at in other jurisdictions, how they do it, um, is there something else you could propose that would be more practical and, and perhaps allow you to um, enforce rules and, and so on a bit better. So, Chair, through you, I think, I mean, the main idea that 
that, that, that we now in the appeal court shows that, they, that, that we are successful in terms of measurement. Because in this case, the person got a, a, a notice of violation and paid a fine. So they were above the, um, the, 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 the prescribed levels. So we do, I mean, we do get, get um, good results. Of course, there is always, we can always look at doing it differently. We can always look at doing it better. But it is, it is working, um, especially now with the 30 minutes. Because I think in the wild goose, sorry. Yeah, can't help myself. Um, <laughs> Right. In, in that matter, I think it was three hours. It was still 30 minutes? Yeah, it was 30 minutes. OK. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So how did you arrive at the 30 minutes? Is, um, is it an international standard, or you on your own decided, let's, let's see what's best for our situation? Yeah. Well, uh, Chair, it was actually in the legislation, events without variations were 30 minutes and events with variations was three hours. So we actually just brought it down. So all events with or without variations will be 30 minutes. Remember, I am okay in something. Do you suggest that we could decrease the limit of the, you know, the, the decibels? I mean, is it something we could consider? Apart from decibel level, I'm just concerned about the method of um, the measuring because for example, fireworks. Um, you, fireworks is very loud, but it's not consistent. So if you had to measure decibel levels of fireworks, for example, um, are you really going to get a 30 minute reading? You're not, exactly. So it's, that's why I'm saying it's useless because the things that really affect people, again, San Fernando Hill and fireworks, it looks lovely. I like to see it, but look, I, let me be very honest. I have a, a special needs child who I have to have special headphones for every event because she's terrified, not to mention my animals. I think a kangaroo in the zoo, they blame the fireworks for him dying on, on, on noise and fireworks. So you all have to be um, conscious of the fact that if what you're doing and the method that you are allowed to use to measure isn't working and cannot work for something like fireworks, um, then you have to find some other way to measure. So apart from the decibel level, even if we give people a variation and we acknowledge carnival, special events, we, we could tolerate a little bit of noise, um, if they are breaching it, your method of actually detecting, detecting and enforcing, because detecting it is the first problem. So if you can't detect it, you can't enforce. So it's like any other crime. You have to be able to detect and then enforce, right? So the method of detection, I think, has to be looked at to, to, to be improved, because it can't be 30 minutes of consistent noise. You will, a whole host of noisy events and, and issues will not be able to be detected. And then, of course, well, the enforcement, we know you have your challenges there, but we'll, we'll entertain recommendations for that as well. Do you have a, like a, 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 a continuous spectrogram instrument which could have continuous noise, or is it that your desk value just gives you a, a Basic time. Yeah. Again, it's 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 measuring. I mean, continuously with a readout. Um, Giselle, you are the experts again. Thank you. Um, yes, through um, to you, Chair. Um, the equipment that we utilize and the measurement standard is specified in the noise pollution control rules. It's on the schedule two, and it is in keeping with international best practice. What is required. Um, especially when you're looking at standards and measuring noise levels against um, specific decibel levels. So it's, it's, um, it's something that we must follow in terms of um, the requirements to get proper, a proper measurement and what would be considered an accurate measurement of what the sound level is at that particular point in time. Um, the, um, type of instrument, the, the standard specified is in accordance with IEC. Um, so what we do, what we purchase, it must be in line with those standards. The equipment we use, it is calibrated annually. It's sent for man, uh, master calibration to ensure it is always optimally um, functioning at the time of use. And it, it is within those parameters that we must um, operate in terms of establishing what is a breach, what would be considered a breach. You do the best practices, you follow yes. the best practice. Good. But one thing, but, but then look, look at WHO. They had recommended 
lower values of decibel levels. So why don't we look at it as a public health issue, just as how, you know, consider it like, like, like secondhand smoke then. It comes like uh, the noise comes to me, I'm not asking for it, I have no control of it, and it causes harm. Can't we now, you know, seriously look into the discussion if WHO's recommend lower values for noise? Could we now look at that option of having these venues have a lower value to protect our public who may not know? Uh, uh, they may go to carnival fets whole season and end up with damage later on with their, 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 their hearing problems and hearing impairment. And now you're looking at a, a, a elderly population, Trinidad and Tobago, as an aging population. So imagine you go in every carnival to these things, you're not going to have a greater degree of impairment later on. So as a public health um, benefit, should, would you all consider looking at low end, the values also? And Chairman, we have no objection to low end the values. I mean, Trinidad and Tobago's values are high compared to, and we did give you a listing of, of other countries and the values. Um, however, as you noted, um, the promoters um, are of the opinion that the values are too low. Um, but I'm looking at WHO, we followed all the COVID guidelines and their things. So right now, we have to look at the guidelines for hearing impairment, all the other disorders you think. So I think, I think the promoters is one issue, but then we have to look at protecting the environment and the burden of health later on for the Minister of Health to have to go now and see high pressure, stroke, hearing problems. So this is what we have to look at, uh, protecting Better the public less. also. Um, so, okay. Very quickly, um, whether the decibel level is 65, 85, 105, the EMA has not proven itself to be effective in um, enforcing levels and in bringing relief to complaints in the public. My question to you is what challenges you face, um, because the purpose of this in inquiry is to make recommendations to fix the problem. You have ex ex um, indicated you're continuing your staff. Does the EMA have a shortage of staff? Does the EMA, is the have vacancies right now that are not filled, that require filling? Or is it that your cadre has to be expanded to meet your demands? What um, challenges do you face when it comes to um, executing your responsibility, responding to complaints and so on, based on your staff complement? So, um, Chairman, I mean, just to remind um, members, yourself and members of the committee, I mean, that the remit of the EME is with respect to the, our, our EM Act and um, noise pollution control rules. And really, it's really the EME is, is, is controlling sound from events, commercial, and industrial sources. The other pieces of legislation is what is supposed to be dealing with noise from your neighbor, noise from bars, and all other noise is, is, is supposed to be well handled in other pieces of legislation under the Summary Offenses Act and, and, and other pieces of legislation. Just to remind the, the, the committee of this. With respect to staffing, yes, I mean, we need to we look at, at our complement with respect to our noise unit. We surely need um, more, more people, and especially if we are looking at an amendment to the, to, to, to the rules. And secondly, with respect to the environmental police unit, and we're in active discussions with the uh, TTPS with respect to expanding the, the environmental police unit, because at present we just have 13 officers. Um, the complement we are looking at is closer to 40 officers, both in, well, up in Trinidad and Tobago, up to 40 officers. And of course, this will assist in terms of, of, of more surveillance, because we, we, we remind you that the, our EPU are police officers and therefore have the powers of the police. They, 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 yes, they have the EM 
um, um, the EM Act legislation to enforce, but they can also use police legislation to enforce. So yes, we need um, 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 more staffing. We have, I mean, um, of course, put in for more staffing in terms of increased budget to the line ministry. And we know, I mean, we are among everybody else who is looking for more. And, and, and hopefully, I mean, um, in the, in either in the new financial year, we will see the increase. Do you have vacancies now that are not filled? We have vacancies now that are not filled, yes. Not um, in the noise unit, no, um, but in other units, because remember the waste rules only came into in effect in last year. And so therefore we have lots of vacancies in, in, in that unit, the waste unit. Um, the, the revision of the water pollution rules meant that we needed more people there. Um, the air rules, we need more people there. As we move towards Green Climate Fund certification, we, we will need more people there. So, of course, yes, we, we do have vacancies. I know this, this um, inquiry is specifically to deal with um, the noise, the focus on noise pollution, but um, we often meet agencies who have vacancies, but they, uh, we have to know what the challenge is with filling those vacancies, right? Yeah, no problem. Thank you for so that. Perhaps you can submit it in writing to the committee. Sure, yeah. we, we'll submit in if writing. If it is that the, the government has not provided the funding for you to fill the vacancies, is it an issue with the public service, com with the service no, commission? No, 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 we don't deal or? with service commission. We get uh, yeah. a, a transfer from, from parliament. Right. Um, sadly, so, I mean, sadly, the transfer has been very consistent at 40 million for the last seven years. So it's not seven years. needs. <laughs> so... That is something I would like if they could submit. They could submit it in writing. What are the challenges with filling your vacancies? M Member Julian. Thank you, like you so much, up? Chairman. Chairman, through you, I noticed that you said in the noise unit you only have four persons. Right? What are the roles and responsibilities of these, well, only four persons? Giselle, you want to um, you want to, to to handle that as the she's the person in charge of noise. Um, so the noise unit um, is responsible um, primarily for um, processing applications received for noise variations. So we process the permits and then we hand over to EPU for monitoring. Um, currently, we focused mainly on um, processing um, applications for event variations, that is variations issued for persons having one-off events. Um, we are in the process of working towards um, moving towards processing variations for facilities, so activities that don't fall within the sphere of events, you know, woodworking shops, those types of things. Those are the, the areas that we're working towards, of course, um, as the um, as the managing director indicated, um, there are th certain things that has to be addressed through amendments which we have proposed, and that will, of course, require an increase in the, um, the staffing of the unit. Thank you very much. Um, through you, Chairman, I'm very happy to hear the EPU come up yet again. Your submission indicated that the EMA is in discussions with TTPS to revise the program and a certain demand power necessary for effectively operating a 24-hour shift system. Can you provide us a status update on these discussions and what is the proposed time frame? Um, the last meeting would have been earlier on this year um, um, with, with um, uh, one of the the deputy commissioners of police. Um, we are, I mean, we've gotten information from the from the police uh, because one of the, the one of the big challenges, of course, is going to be budget, and therefore we need to be very clear what it will cost the EME in terms of this additional component. So we're getting that information from the um, from the TTPS, and um, the time frame that we're looking at is based on the time of year we're in, that we will have everything in so that we will have a, a, an expanded police unit come the new financial year, which is October October of this year. So, Chair Chairman, 
Are you all in any discussions with the municipal police for assistance when it comes to noise pollution matters? Um, we attend the, all the regional corporations. I mean, we attend their meetings. Um, and um, we started a conversation um, in terms of, and I don't know if it was it's either San Fernando and a couple other corporations in terms of actually educating the corporations about the noise pollution rules and, and, and how the noise pollution rules um, operate. Um, specific, I mean, municipal police would have been present at those uh, um, events. We really have not had specific discussions with municipal police. And, 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 and we hear you, I mean, and that is something we will take on board. And in terms of, I mean, can they enforce um, 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 on the, well, they can't enforce under the EM Act, um, but maybe they can enforce on the other pieces of legislation. Chairman, one more question, please. Thank you. Through you, Chair. I told us a bit, well, interesting that the it was stated that no requests for assistance were made to the TTPS by the EMA or the EMA police unit for assistance during the 2023 carnival period. The reason why I thought this was particularly interesting, I hope it does not imply that the reason why there weren't any requests is because there weren't any complaints. Obviously, there would have been complaints. Now, I live in a um, commercial area, so I can't sleep without the noise, right? I I'm so used to it. But given the current manpower resources of the EPU and the fact that it's in inadequate, we have established that, why wasn't the assistance of the T TTPS not required or requested during the 2023 carnival period? Uh, I am sure that we talked to the, TP the TTPS and the EPU talked to the T TTPS consistently um, in terms of, of events. Um, so I am unsure who would have said that no request was made to the TTPS. Well, this is what was submitted to us by, by, the, by the TTPS? By the TTPS. Well, okay. Um, so, so maybe, I mean, the challenge here is that we have our EPU officers talking with their colleagues in, in, the, in the police service in a more casual manner in terms of they will call, if there's an event at a police, um, in a district, they will call the police station to say that they are going to the district and, 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 and maybe what it is, the TTPS is requested that we do it more officially. But well, we have yeah, had but that before. I would suggest the TTPS answer that question for us. Yes. Yes, Chairman. Yes, good. Um, thank you, Chair. ACP Cooper, what happened or what actually happens on the ground? The officers who do the monitoring of events, the big FETs, the large FETs, what they will do, um, they will come, that is the EPU personnel, they would come at the events and whomever the officer is at that event, the senior person, they will communicate with them indicating that the promoter, the music is beyond the decibel level. And that is where something is done unofficially and it would not be recorded. So I know of instances where um, some things are done on the spot. And um, the other parts of the reports concerning the noise pollution persons would call in, that's the public will call in and make that request. Those are the reports that we have recorded. But to say specifically EPU persons making official reports, we may not have that, but we would have them doing it unofficially. So as the events are taking place, they would seek the assistance of the officers and that is where we will act immediately. Thank you. But again, it, it was mentioned we would need to register those uh, breaches also. So we would have a file compiled that you were called in and you had to put it in. Um, because we'll have no record of that. And you see, the impression what I've gotten here is either the EPE was, was doing such a good job they didn't need you guys, or 
the public is just disillusioned, so they're not calling again. So we need to have that um, that documented, please. Right here. Sure. Chairman, through you to the TTPS, I I do have a question because there would be it's not under the EM. It will be under summaries, I would guess. But for example, I noticed someone spoke about um a machine shop, a woodwork shop, a mechanic, a gym, all in the a residential area. Or maybe a karaoke place that open in the middle of Malabar, perhaps. And very often, the public would come to their MPs or councillors and make these complaints, and we would direct them to TTPS, but nothing happens. There's, a, there's what can they be charged under? What can we request with regards to these particular noise pollutants? So, truly, Chair, reports such as persons doing construction work, persons doing repairs to their vehicles, the TTPS, based on the complaint from the public or citizen, the officers on receiving the report, they would direct it to the officers who are out there on patrol where well, the time would go to that specific individual or business and speak to them concerning the, the nuisance in relation to noise emanating from the business place and make such recommendations. Um, the police officers, you know, do not have anything to test the noise level. However, however, I think by the officers speaking with the business persons or the persons who are actually doing the construction there may make recommendations as to how to reduce the noise level once it's affecting the residents within the area. Before that, I, I, I remember reading somewhere that the um, Previous acting commissioner of police, Mr. McDonald Jacobs, said officers were being trained in um, use of these devices. So I was under the impression you all already got some of those devices. Could you give me an update? Um. So, Chair, um, we have acquired at least 10 noise meters. We have started the process with familiarizing the officers as to the use of the noise meters. So we are yet to have that proper training through EME, who are the experts. And following that training, the noise meters on them will be distributed to assist with noise pollution within the public space. So EME, do you have any sort of suggestion, a time frame that you may allow this? We've done it before. I can't remember the last year we would have done it in 20 what way? Maybe last time we'd have done training with the TTPS is around 2017. So we are prepared. I mean, once the request is made, we are prepared to facilitate um, more training. Thank you. Chair, through you, is it the intention that these 10 noise meters would be deployed so officers who are doing extra duty at events where noise variations were requested? That's one question. The second question, could you give us any statistics about the number of persons charged, let's say, within the last five years with the offense of a nuisance, I think it is under the Summary Offenses Act, based on noise, specifically? Um, because police speaking to people who are causing a disruption and so on, let's say it's a machine shop or whatever it is, um, might be, you know, uh, a soft approach, which we understand if somebody's carrying out renovations at their home or it's part of their business and so on. But there are instances, and I, I don't mean to be constantly referring to my personal experiences, but I think that's what we're here for. We're here to, we have the opportunity to explain what the average citizen, which we function as when we leave here, uh, what the average citizen endures. The person who is 
simply parking a vehicle by a gas station and pounding music out of a vehicle at 2 o'clock in the morning. Personal experience, contacted San Fernando Police Station, nothing. Um, perhaps it might go down for five minutes, and apparently that's when the police leave and then it goes back up. Um, you know, is there some sort of directive or policy that these sort of, you know, how do the police treat with these matters? Because the EMA can't. Quite simply, they can't. So it's, it's left to the police to treat with it. Um, I remember calling a police station, and I know this will sound funny, but it's, it's very real, calling a police station to complain about somebody bursting bamboo for over a period of two hours during the Wali time. And after spelling my name about three times for the officer, he said, but, but it's the Wali, I mean, what kind of, you know, and he said, well, what kind of, you know, you is? And I said, you know, that, that is the response that you get from the police when they said, so I don't know that there's a serious, um, that these sort of complaints are taken seriously enough by the police. The police have a discretion to exercise when it comes to, for example, somebody renovating their home versus somebody just creating what is a real nuisance, particularly in residential areas. And from everything we've heard today, I think it is very clear that it's only the police that can treat with these matters and take immediate action to deal with it. So what is really the policy, if there's a policy, of the police to treat with these issues and to really bring immediate relief, not long term after you file violation and notice and due process and natural justice and immediate relief as in to stop um, a nuisance that is in taking place, that is in, in the process of taking place. Through the chair, with respect to our immediate approach, our immediate approach is to speak to the persons and them that are committing the offenses. And we also expect our citizenry to be responsible. So okay. events, when we have events such as Diwali, such as Christmas, such as New Year's, when we have the heightened um, noise that you know may take place, noise pollution that may take place, what we do, we take, we are proactive we use our social media, we use our platform, our TTPS media, and we try to speak with the public to let them know the need to actually reduce the noise level, the need to not allow persons to be uncomfortable within their environment. So we hope that the, the public themselves could be held responsible, could be responsible enough, because we all have to live here. With respect to the distribution of the noise meters, as soon as the training is fully done, those meters will be distributed. I know it's not enough, but hopefully they will be distributed in areas where we have the heightened noise level in relation to carnival activities. For instance, in the West, in the Western area, and also in Port of Spain and San Fernando. And I think we just need to start somewhere and hope that we reach at least to cut down on the amount of reports that we have been receiving. With respect to the data on, new to, on nuisance, I do not have that data here before me, so we can supply that at a later stage. Thank you. Your, you had an app once, a TTPS app. Does it still exist where people could make complaints? So therefore, if I have a noise complaint, I could, so at least hopefully that will be a um, uh, way that it's documented there. Do you have that, compl uh, that system still? Chair, yes, we still have that app where persons can make um, any complaint they need to make. Okay. And the them. initiative to give the te to buy those 10 meters, was it from the police side or was it the EMA had directed that? Did you take it on your own to say, let's go on an initiative from your acting um, commissioner of police then? Chair, um, I am unable to say okay, sure. where it came from, but it was purchased. Through the TTPS. Yeah. EMA, was it from your side or was it? Um... Uh, 
a long time ago when we were buying the, the, the meters and we were trying to engage the police, we had we were in we were of the hope that the EMA would have been able to buy the, the, the meters for the police and that, that fell through. And therefore, I think the, 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 the police, but on their initiative, they, 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 they would have bought the, the meters. I, I also understood um, what um, Member Lodge-Pedial was saying, you know, the, the, the police officer now um, saying it's just Diwali. Do you police officers have any retraining for your officers to take persons, um, complaints um, with a certain degree of um, you know, seriousness and okay. efficiency and professionalism? Chair, um, as professionals within the TTPS, we are guided by our standing orders. We are guided by our acts regulations. And police officers supposed to treat whatever report they get as something serious. Um, is it, okay, I know you all deal with major crime, right? Is it a low lying food for you to come and? interfere with noise. Do you also figure that police time would be better served policing for crime like, like, like going after criminals, thieves, burglary, bandits, and the EMA now developing a greater degree of um, power to look at machine shops, to look at um, other sources of noise, other sources of nuisance, where your officers would be like, as I'm saying, a noise officer or a, a, a noise warden or whatnot, and you can now take the the, the brunt from, you know, you mentioned a lot of other pieces of legislation that would have to be filled by other entities. Could you take that into your account that you will now be able to bring those things into your ambit? Uh, Chairman, it is possible, I mean, but of course, I mean, the resources will, will, will yeah. need to be provided, I mean, but it is possible. possible. I think the idea of, of ticketing, I mean, we've seen its, it's work with, um, with driving under the influence, it's work with um, speeding. So therefore, I mean, based on the nature of the problem, the extent of the problem, I mean, um, we, maybe we can do ticketing for noise too. That uh, marine causes uh, of noise pollution, the effects on the on the uh, marine life and the habitat. Um, there are in our area we are drilling for oil. We are sending down these piles. It causes a major problem in other countries, and Germany have recognized that. Recognized that, and they have a system where they have bubbles, a bubble system where if you're going to put a pile. You have water bubbles coming up there to nullify that song. Do you recommend to the oil industry to have these measures into place? Well, um, as part of the CEC, the Certificate of Environmental Clearance uh, process, mm -hmm. we would make recommendations um, for, for various activities that would have an impact on marine life. Um, surveys um, for the oil and gas industry, um, uh, coastal um, coastal projects, uh, reclamation projects. So we do have conditions as to whether I mean now the conditions would is always related to to, to best practice mm -hmm. um, um, and, and affordability. Win, help me out here. Um, best practice. Um, Huh? Best best available, available. Te okay. technology. Okay. Okay. Um, so yeah. therefore, I mean, it might not go to the extent of Germany and these okay. other places. Right. Yeah. Because because it, I was looking at the fact that as I say Germany has the bubble curtains in any sort of construction. They have that is their standard now, and I think Taiwan is also going to follow suit. So again, if we are going to explore for oil, yeah. this is something you may have to say: Do we bring that on board? And also, there was the the Musk. Danish shipping company, and I think it was 2017, they looked at the propellers in these um, um, large ships and they realized that the propellers, you know, would cause a lot of noise. And they actually made a circular damping effect, which again has the efficiency of these 
vessels in terms of saving of their fuel, as well as against the noise pollution. And they actually saw that this would have decreased the um, acoustic footprint of some of the large vessels by about 75%, by slowing down the, the vessel um, speed, as well as having the propeller enclosed. In, in, in do you do checks or for the ships coming in here? Would, you, would that be something you will have to do in the future or looking into that? Chair, it will not be the remit of the EMA, it will be the remit of, of maybe maritime services. And we do and we do have a new shipping act. I'm, I'm not sure what is the status of, of the new shipping act, but but it's 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 happening. Member Hislop. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, just, just want to look at two things um, as it relates to fireworks. Um, both in the TTPS submission and the EMA submission, we've seen a correlation here between the issue of fireworks. Um, the first thing, first question to the TTPS is that the Commission of Police made a decision that they will grant written permission to let off fireworks in Trinidad and Tobago. Um, how many written approvals have been issued or granted in 2022? And uh, how has your public relations uh, communication, how has that, how's the communication been with the public with regards to applying for, for the written permission? Trudy Chair. <clears throat> With respect to the data concerning how many applications were made and granted, I do not have that with me here today, but that can be supplied. Right. With respect to the um, information going out there to the public, we use our media forum to ensure that that message was conveyed to the public. So the commissioner ensured that if any fireworks needed to be you know, displayed, the public was aware that they had to make an application in order for that to be granted. Other than that, no agency or no one on their own could have, you know, um, have any sort of display without that permit. And if they did, it would have been stopped. So, so Chairman, so follow up on that. So we still have this scenario where various entities selling fireworks on the side of the road. Um, and I could, go as a, I could go as a regular citizen, purchase the fireworks. The written permission is to be given or is to be sought by whom? The regular citizen or an agency that wants to, be, to, to send off fireworks? Um, to you, Chair. Um, remember the... The licensing regime is really for the people who sell. So the average citizen still go and buy. When the explosive prohibition of scratch bomb order was made, it targeted scratch bomb. So what that did is just particularly pointed to scratch bomb. However, there were other things that could have exploded the same way, but they were not targeted. So this is why you still have the ability to apply for permits under the Act, the Summary Offenses Act. There is the process of the application still being made and granted by the committee to persons who want to sell and even import. So this order, because of the complaint made by the citizenry at the time, based on the fact that you would um, throw it, you would have it explode in something, that complaint only a targeted scratch bomb for that issue. The whole other aspect of applying for it, which is the licensing regime and persons selling it and persons being able to buy, that was not targeted. Well, Mr. Chairman, I, I'm not even dealing with the, 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 the license to sell. If I'm, I'm looking, I'm reading here, and it says the Commission of Police made a decision that administratively will grant written permission to let off fireworks in Trinidad and Tobago. 
However, this written permission is granted by the COP under certain conditions which must be adhered to. So I'm, I'm just I'm asking for clarity. The written permission to let off fireworks, who, who is to seek that written permission? If I remember his love wants to send off some fireworks at my home, do I have to have written permission from the Commission of Police to do so? Or it is, is it just for, for large events? Large, well, the large events, yes, but also the average citizen, based on the language used in the legislation, doesn't require the license. It's for the people who actually sell in. So the individuals who sell in large, bulk, in large quantities on the highways and the byways and whatever, they will get the light. They will make the application for the license. The average, that's why the average citizen still go and apply, no, still buy. Mr. Chairman, sorry, not to, not to interrupt you, Inspector, but I, I'm, re, I'm, quote, I'm looking at the quotation here. The grant to, will grant written permission to let off fireworks, not to sell. So it means that I have to have, if, and, and as I'm asking, if the permission to fire off the fireworks, or is it shoot the fireworks? If, is, is that, is that, am I, as a regular citizen, to seek written permission to shoot off the fireworks? If I go, if I go by one of the, 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 the suppliers of fireworks, for old years, for Diwali, for New Year's, do I have to have written permission? Trudy Chair, um, what happens, as you said, you saw persons on the side of the road selling these fireworks, but the permission is granted to persons who want to actually use the fireworks for displays and, and you know, right, that is asking, the yeah. purpose of the permission being granted. So who, so who is, is this for personal use? Or is the permission for personal use or for an event? Well, as it says here, under certain conditions must be adhered to. And that is in the commissioner's remit. Chair, if I may. So I'll give way to, to member Lottery. Isn't there a requirement in the law that it isn't it a breach of the law that sending off fireworks within I think it is sixty sixty feet within the city or something like that is an offense? Yes. So if you want, so even a person, who, as uh, Member Hislop is referring to, about personal use, so people having a party at their home, a big birthday party, and they're sending off fireworks, shouldn't they either have permission or aren't they breaking the law if once they live within um, a, a built-up or residential area um, within the city limits? Chair, um, as I said before, the purpose of the fireworks is for events where persons will actually use the fireworks. But persons, as the document states, under certain conditions. Under no conditions would the commissioner grant any license to any person to actually use the fireworks within a residential area. So, so Chairman, I, I think we got to the bottom of it. So, yeah. so yes. the, in, in all reality, we, we deal with a situation where we're shooting ourselves in the foot. So someone has the permission to bring in fireworks, sell it on the side of the street. But I should, under regulations, get written permission from the Commission of Police to purchase the fireworks, to launch it. But I could still go to the side of the street and purchase the fireworks without the written permission. Yes, sir. Okay. So, just to follow up, <laughs> I'm dealing with fireworks as well, and this is to the EMA, Mr. Chairman. Uh, it relates to the United Kingdom's Pyrotechnic Articles Regulation 2050, categorization of fireworks into the local legislation framework. The question is, or the questions are, what resources and systems are required in order to successfully incorporate the UK's categorization of fireworks into the local legislation framework? What progress has been achieved in pursuing the implementation of this categorization? Um, after information regarding noise, nuisance, oh sorry, yeah, I think those are the two questions, sorry. 
Well, Chairman, members, I mean, I think the EME has, since 2021, made its position abundantly clear with respect to fireworks. You know, that we have said it should be noise reducing or noise less, however you want to categorize it, um, in accordance with the UK um, 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 legislation. It is with the Office of the Attorney General, and I mean, we would have to ask, I mean, the Attorney General, what is the status of this? Because we, we are not aware. I, I think there are consultations taking place with regards to that, with the fireworks legislation. Chair, through you, if I may ask a, two questions. Um, just follow, I follow up from Emma Hislow's question. I just want to, maybe I'll put you on the spot, but would the EME, based on what you do, your research, so would you support a total ban on the importation of non-noiseless fireworks? That's what we have recommended in our okay, position, good. people. I'm happy to hear that. Um, and my second question is to the Ministry of um, Planning. Um, I think we've spoken about a lot of issues today that we keep saying the legislation, and perhaps we would have to make recommendations coming from here as well about legislative amendments. In your submission, you spoke about a technical paper submitted by the EME, um, which is under review with the intention of um, that maybe, you know, I guess the catalyst for uh, legislative amendments. Um, do you have any sort of timeline for the completion of that review? And the paper that's submitted, um, could you give us a little insight into what amendments um, may, you may see coming out of that um, those recommendations and what impact it may have on the operations of the EMA. What I can commit to is probably before the end of this fiscal, ensuring that we review it, but the EMA, if they think they want to put that out there just yet, because you know there's a process, so you don't necessarily want to uh, put things out there that may or may, may not may happen. Not happen right. You know, so it, it is going to be reviewed and, um, and then the minister and so on. The, the process will be followed. Yes? But even, Hi. member and, and chair, as I have the floor, I must say that I've listened very closely to the discoveries in terms of gaps in legislation, and I do understand the purpose of this joint select. Um, and I hear what you say in terms of let's go after solutions. And I'm wondering, I mean, clearly you've discovered the gaps in legislation. Clearly you've seen that there's a problem with coordination. And um, I I'm wondering if some of the solutions could be, I mean, Trinidadians are very innovative and creative people. And if in, if in other jurisdictions, my colleague has spoken to the science of how to use the, the boxes and the, 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 the um, speakers and so on. If in other jurisdictions, the science has guided the acoustics level, I'm wondering if, if in terms of your further examination and maybe in terms of your recommendations, more could be said even in terms of, and I have to be very careful here, that would support even the regulators like town and country within my own ministry, again the EMA, to come up with standards that may point to certain kinds of designs. So you talked about NAPA and SAPA. If we understood the kinds of things that could happen there because we are Trini said well, it's gone way beyond culture and arts and speak to certain, insist on certain kinds of designs to keep the acoustics and the sound where it's supposed to stay, as opposed to leaking out to everybody, because you always can't guarantee that only certain things will happen in certain places, if you understand what I mean. You are not in the backyard of, 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 of Sapa, but you chose to live in the city. And by just doing that, you've been, been exposed to a number of things. So, so suggestions like that, further thoughts along those lines. I, even residential areas, the challenge is they got an approval for a house. But once every blue moon that becomes more than a blue moon, they have a party, they have a fete. And you can't run to enforce against, that is not enforceable because it is a home and they're having entertainment. So it is not something that is immediately enforceable in that particular way. Yes, we know what the EMA does. I'm just thinking broad base in terms of other opportunities for enforcement. But again, we've seen some churches have, have 
blossomed in residential areas. And some have been very supportive in basic air conditioning the entire property so that the sound of the music during worship stays there and is not such a nuisance. Twin City has done a few of that. It's not such a nuisance to the neighbors. You, you, you get where I'm going? So as we focus on solutions and possibilities, I'm just thinking that um, further research and the ministry is willing to support any kind of coordination of this kind of approach and not just a legislative approach, but we understand the power of having the right kind of legislation, the big stick to back up the other ways in which a thing could be done. Just a thought. Well, yes, um, I, I, I agree to some extent with what you're saying. Um, perhaps within your own ministry, the issue of planning and permission in terms of construction of venues and facilities and its proximity to residential areas um, and the legislation, I think what it's called, is it Planning and Development Act? Is? When that is um, fully rolled out, right, when that is fully rolled out and implemented, which we've looked at in another GSE, actually, the delays in, in implementing that legislation, um, it would lend some um, value to this because at the end of the day, I've attended um, numerous concerts in foreign jurisdictions and it doesn't affect neighbors because they aren't held in places where they are neighbors. They specifically, they, they plan, which is what your ministry is supposed to be encouraging, they plan with intent. So you don't build a, con, um, a, a performance art center that's fully enclosed, but then rent out the car park to throw a fet with speakers facing an old age home. That's just not heard of in, in developed countries. It, but it's done here and it's part of our culture. You see a big open space where you could put a tent and put speakers and build a stage is a fat venue for carnival, right? So we have a sporting venue in San Fernando, which has turned into, which was a, a cricket stadium, which has now turned into the biggest juve style party space. So the problem is not really that somebody chooses to live in the city, it's that places are being built in close proximity to residential areas and are then being used for purposes for which they were never intended. Had residents, for example, in Gopal Lands in Marabella or in Coconut Drive or Gulf View or Lesafor um, East in Lesafor West in San Fernando, known that Sapa or the Brian Lara Stadium were going to be fed venues. I'm sure they might have had the opportunity to object and to do those things. And all of that falls under town and country planning division and all of those things which fall within your ministry. So that's one um, aspect of it that I think we need to look at as well. So it can't be that everybody, um, um, we get creative and so on. And with respect to people having uh, more than a blue moon events at their home, the law still has to be enforced. And to say that something like that is not enforceable, um, I think that that's, that's actually encouraging the, the culture of non-compliance with the law that we have in Trinidad and Tobago. Regardless of where you live, you have to have a minimum standard of compliance with the law, and you cannot create a nuisance because that is the law, and there's a reason why we have a law on, on, on nuisance. And the third thing is that we recognize legislation can't do everything, but that's where, and that's why on every time we sit here in every GSC, not only just this one, on each one, we have a discussion about enforcement because the law could be there as we do have the law on nuisance, but this is the enforcement and equipping the right people to be able to enforce the law. Because as we've seen here, the EMA could test, but they can't enforce. And the TTPS could enforce, but they don't have the, the enough of the equipment and training and so on to, to do the testing. And therefore, we, we lack a lot of synergy in terms of how organizations who have responsibilities under the law, um, and, and, and we have a, a, a distribution of resources in a manner that really isn't achieving anything at the end of the day, because every single citizen, if you walk outside here and poll 100 people right on, this, on St. Vincent Street here, I'm sure about 90 of them will complain about noise where they live and, and problems that they have with noise. So it cannot be that such a, um, you know, uh, that so much of the population is affected by an issue and we don't really treat with it from all angles and deal with the enforcement issue and look for solutions that, that, that would better um, thing because it definitely is a problem. And being creative is one thing, but enforcing the law as it stands, knowing that it's been there, I think is part of the, the mandate and something that we have to consider and propose and, and, and you know, support as a responsible group of um, you know, representatives. Chair, allow me one minute in response. Absolutely agreed in terms of what you're saying. When I said it was not enforceable, in my mind I was actually referring to one particular bit of legislation, but of course it's enforceable under nuisance and, and 
and summary offenses and that sort of thing. So just to make it clear. Okay. And I think we're on the same page. We, we are actually agreeing. And I did not at all mean to imply that it is your fault that you chose to live in the city at all. Sure. What I'm saying is also what I think everybody else is saying. This is an opportunity. This kind of investigation has revealed some serious gaps in the legislation. But it's also gaps in processes. And I think we do have an opportunity to have a coordinated response and a coordinated approach. And that's all I'm agreeing with, that it's going to take more than legislation is important, but we are going to have to really work together as a team. And there are other stakeholders who may not be here yet. I, I could give one little example of the way in which the EMA and local government, I think local government really has a part to play in this as well, and we, have, we may not have spent a lot of time with them or on them about this. I've always put forward the view, enforcement, enforcement continues to be a problem. And everybody continues to say they don't have enough staff to do enforcement. Mm. But there are so many agencies that have the responsibility and have staff pertaining to enforcement. Is it so impossible that we could have an almost generic, possibly all-embracing kind of training for enforcement officers, we may then discover that we actually have more staff than we thought. So you have town and country that enforces, you have EMA that enforces, you have other, you have forestry division, you have local government, but everybody's complaining we don't have staff. At one point in time, in another era, in another dimension, another time, there was talk about, an, uh, you will see another agency, but there was talk about how we could collaborate all of those resources. So even if you're a public health officer, you're going out there, you will notice more than grease in the drain that, there should, that should not be there. You would notice other kinds of enforcement. So uh, again, we're continuing to say, let's find creative approaches as well as you know, the standard approaches to address the matter. So we are agreeing. Speaking about the city, right? Remember, we may live in a city, it may be noisy, but if we look at the ambient noise levels, um, medical research has shown us now that we have to aim to decrease that um, average level from around 75 to 80. So some countries may decide they're going to buffer, like more the transport areas, like where they have the trains coming in, they want to buffer so the public would not have that level of noise. Because there was a study, I think it was 2007, where they did 200,000 hearing tests worldwide on city residents. And they noticed they lost as much hearing, you know, the ones in the city, as if they were 20 years older. So it's significant. We now would have to see how are we going to reduce the level of noise in the towns? What could we put in place? So this is why, looking at, okay, bars, when a bar is opening, um, is it your department um, from uh, Ms. RPS that would go in and say, well, they have to have soundproofing? Is it the, is it the um, you know, like sometimes they go for a license, they have to get the fire um, services to grant them that. So in terms of soundproofing, these, um, whose um, ambit does that fall under? A number of agencies are involved in that process in terms of getting the, the liquor license and all of that. Um, if my director does not mind, I can let her share a little bit about what the process entails. But the statutory approvals, okay, yeah. that's good. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Through you, Chair, I'd like to address this matter. Um, the matter of opening a bar, opening a restaurant and bar, it has been raised at, the, at this hearing. And uh, what is expected is that prospectively, the person who desires to develop, that is to um, conduct building operations for the erection of a, a building that would be used for the purpose of a bar, uh, a restaurant, that this person would submit prospectively uh, an application for that purpose. We, of course, it would be considered at the Town and Country Planning Division. We will look at our standards. Uh, the commercial standards, we look at the policy, we look at the location, and uh, determine accordingly. Ideally, the app developer would be able to comply with the set standard. But of, we don't live in an ideal world. We sometimes get applications where the person has uh, clearly very visible infringements, etc. And even if they were to submit, they would not be 
approved based on maybe the policy for the area. It may be a residential area. It may be an, er an area where um, they may have site development issues, et cetera. Now, one must bear in mind, because we're speaking about the bars, the restaurants, et cetera, that it doesn't end there. Even if we were to give this uh, permission, to grant the planning permission in respect of the application, with, in line with the site development standards, in, and which, of course, would address matters of, and I know, um, Chair, you raised it, the, the distance from the neighboring properties, et cetera. Of course, it's always minded, and of, there are standards for that. Um, even if we were to grant the, the uh, permission, this, of course, would be conditioned. And uh, PS has rightly mentioned that. We also have the, the fire services involved. We also have the regional corporation involved. But, and, uh, but it doesn't end there. If you want to sell an alcoholic beverage, then you'd have to go to the liquor license committee and apply accordingly. Uh, one of the requirements to be submitted, of course, to that committee is the grant of the final planning permission in respect of the building and the use. Because it's not just the building. The building might have planning permission, but the use for the bar may not be the case. So and whether it's a bar or a restaurant and bar, it matters. Okay, yes. okay. Let, let's say I'm going to build my house near to a highway or development. Does the EMA come in now and say you have to have song barriers, you have to have your house equipped in a particular way? So, so the EMA get involved in, in, or even planning, to say that, okay, you know, we know that noise pollution is a serious thing now. So therefore, in the future, if you're going to build a house near a highway or a noisy environment like the airport, you may have to have certain insulated noise barriers in that house. Is that something that um, could be um, feasible? Let, let, let me respond very quickly to that. It is not a, a, a current standard, to, mm. to, to tell you the truth, but coming out of discussions, I think it's something for consideration because you want to help members of the public and you want them to think That's through it. things that they haven't yet considered. considered. And it's a developing thing. Good. You know, the, the creation of standards and land use policies is a developing thing as we discover that something could be improved by yeah. suggesting something yeah. else. So, so, so it's, it's, it's good for consideration so as a matter so of fact. You, it, what I would tell you, one of the things that we do very quickly in mm -hmm. terms of design, mm -hmm. if it's a green field site, meaning there's nothing on it, it's, it's much easier, of course, to introduce the barriers that you spoke about in mm -hmm. terms of trees, right. just to help Perfect. manage the sound. I mean, I'm thinking of one gated community that got approval for what their little community space. I don't know if when the people bought into it, they realized that fets is what happens there. Yeah. So you bought into the community, it's gated, you got all the approvals, and then at some point in time, a decision was made. So you live in there and you kind of have to live with that. Yes. So uh, the point is, up front, there are things we could now consider doing and improving yeah. on, but we still have to have a strategy, strategy. and I know it's the police and, and others, mm. for when it's already happening and they're breaking all of the regulations, how could we support members of the right. public? Okay. Thank you. So the other thing is, you, have, you know, let's look at protecting the public, right? Now, you remember we already mentioned the fact that um, in, in the city dwellers, they have a greater problem with noise. And we have already said, if you have noise, you have problems with learning and reading, etc. So let us say you have an HDC development going up, the apartment buildings, people are so close to each other. This is something in the future you have to know about proper barrier because you know you'll, you'll be affecting that community who are going in that area. So this has to be something that um, in any building codes, I think it's a suggestion we have. And also, some cultures now have what you call a noise score. So a noise score is like a, what I'm looking at is I'm going into a restaurant and there's a sign saying it's not going to go beyond this decibel. So if I know I have to go in there, I could put on my earmuffs and go in and enjoy the restaurant. So, so probably a noise core is something we have to look at in various places. I'm going um, to a transit area and it's a higher level. I will be able to do it. So this is something I'm looking at we could develop um, for our country to you know, help the people. And you know there are apps now in the phones, like there's an app from called something Song Print. So if I'm going into a restaurant, and it's too noisy. I could now take my app, measure the thing, and make a complaint. You know that that that, that it's, it's it's not it's, it's it's affecting me. It's harming me. It's harming my family going there. So I think all these are things we would have to look at and see how we could develop um, for that. Yeah, Yeah, ma'am. 
Mr. Chairman, I would very quickly like to ask two questions. Sure. One is to the Permanent Secretary and the Ministry of Planning. Yes. Some time ago, I had caused... Before we go, Sorry. we are planning to close at 1.15, so we'd have to make sure we can wrap yes. up after questions. So go ahead. Yeah. Yes. I don't mind this answer being submitted in writing if time does not permit. As Member of Parliament, some time ago, I had caused to inquire into the status of the... Um, whether it's residential, commercial, or agricultural lands at Bamboo Settlement. Because we had an agricultural area, and there was a lot of um, parts and vehicle places through the foreign used industry springing up. And so you had a lot of commercial activity, but you still have residential as well. And I was advised that the entire area is considered commercial, sorry, residential slash commercial slash agriculture. So all um, of these activities are permitted. My concern with areas like that is that while we want to support commercial activities and people being able to generate an income, um, how do you prevent, for instance, a bar from operating in an area like that? They have approval because they are a commercial entity, and they would get approval from Tongan Country Planning to have a bar. And, but they would be playing music as is, you know, they're expected to, but the disturbance. And the person who has residential approval also is permitted to be there. And the agriculture and the health aspect where you would have animals in that same area, you may have a stench as is expected from a farm. And how does the Ministry of Planning treat with that? Where you, this, I don't know if it's a new trend, but it doesn't seem to be practical when you do not separate the areas. That's one. Secondly, in giving support to our culture, music trucks on the road for carnival is a normal thing. Um, do you regulate the levels for the music trucks with the safety of the masqueraders in mind? Because masqueraders are very close to the trucks and uh, the, their, air belt will, will be, uh, their ears will be affected. Most people, other people wear air plugs of some sort, but really to enjoy the music, you shouldn't have to wear air plugs. Um, so do you regulate uh, music truck volumes for carnival and those type of cultural event? And my third question is, Technology now allows for um, noiseless parties where patrons are given headphones and earbuds and you can go into, you can be in an open space in a car park and everybody has their um, headphones that is connected to the music of the event and they can enjoy the, mu the event without um, disturbing surrounding areas. Are there incentives, or can you recommend incentives for um, use of technology, not only noiseless headphones, but in other aspects where noise pollution is concerned, where you can have a regime for incentives to, whether it's promoters or private persons, using technology that is noiseless or that will reduce noise? Thank you. Um, I think we could Chair, take question Chair, do one. I do a part response? Huh? Uh, question one could go in writing. I don't know if you could yeah. want to answer. Yeah, question one for writing, but the others, if you want to. And the others seem to be more targeted to the MA since we do not um, mm -hmm. give approvals yes. for music trucks, and mm -hmm. it, it doesn't fall within my remit. Yes. Mm -hmm. I would say 10 seconds about the first question, and I know that it will be sent to us again in writing right, to make yes. sure we get it correctly. Yes. Mm -hmm. But just off, based upon what you've said, and I do understand the challenge, it's almost in some cases what came first, mm -hmm. because we know the agriculture came first, first mm -hmm. and it's almost that you can't penalize somebody for having a farm, and then you have to deal with the stench. So it's a real conflict, and it's a real issue. Notwithstanding that, the power of the town and country approval is really in the conditions. Mm -hmm. And I, I truly appreciate this discussion because it's, makes, it's making us aware that perhaps there are additional conditions we could consider. Conditions don't fall from a hat. 
it means we have a sister agency who has the power to enforce it. So again, we point to the issue of collaboration. If we were to say, look, a condition has got to be the residential area was there first, you want to put up your bar, then all of these other things must be there if we are to give you the approval, and then the local government who gives the final um, construction permit will then have the power to enforce against that. So there's opportunity okay. for consideration in dealing with, well, you know, challenging areas mm -hmm. such as the bamboo. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but point taken. Okay. Uh, so, Chairman, the, uh, the EMA does not regulate sound from moving vehicles. So whether it's party boats, or music trucks. Um, just think about how I, we are going to measure music is moving uh, when you look at the, the EM Act. So it's not the EMA in terms of mu um, music trucks. So this falls within the um, transport, transport division mm -hmm. and the TTPS. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and with respect to Carnival, remember, there's a Carnival proclamation that gives, I mean, it's, yeah. it's, it's a very specific thing that Carnival is declared for X hours in the cities of or whatever it is. And, um, and what we do there is public education in terms of telling people the dangers of noise and hopefully some people are paying attention by wearing earphones and that sort of thing. Yes, Chair, I must mention that as the goal commander for Carnival 2023, we were able to utilize the meeting with the residents, spe specifically in the um, Woodbrook area. And what we came up with, um, which worked this year, was the fact that we identify specific areas um, as noise sensitive areas. Um, where residents were part of that discussion. And we had seven such areas where we posted flags and alerted the music um, trucks that at those areas, there was uh, music sensitive areas and the compliance was really one in which we all were, um, that worked well and we utilize that because of this, the information that we just learned as it relates to the proclamation of Carnival. But despite that, we had respect for the citizens and um, of course what had been happening all along with the residents in the Woodbrook community that we were able to mitigate that risk um, and were able to deal with the issues, especially where places we had um, senior citizens' homes and such like that. So that had worked. Thank you for that, um, that initiative, because we heard the complaints from the Woodbrook residents for years. Um, I, I want to just go on one thing. Let's, I got a, a message WhatsApp. Somebody mentioned they go to the beach, they like to sit with their family, but somebody next to them just blasting speakers. Who will be able to monitor that situation? What do you do? do is it that you have a... Uh, a space where if I have a speaker noise level, who will monitor, who will give a sense of a mitigating factor to the complainants here? So in a situation like that, of course, persons will respond to the police and um, in, in, um, where these reports are made, of course, one has the, the issue the, is just before us again, where the, the decibel measurement is what is required in terms of ensuring that we are able to measure um, the noise level um, in, in that circumstances. And therefore, we have just learned in a situation where if we had to, what we will be doing at times is to use moral persuasions to talk to people in terms of treating such a situation. Outside of that, we have now acquired, we are looking, um, to, uh, we have acquired, and where training can um, take place, to, um, where we acquire our own decibel uh, meters, where we can be able to test 
on our own and to treat with such a situation. No, it's three areas in the beach. A certain within a flag area, as you mentioned. Yeah. This is the area it wouldn't, I mean, who want to make noise, they go to the other side of the beach. Well, that, of course, I mean, those are other um, recommendations that can be put in place in place. terms of how we treat with that. Um, some countries, like I think Germany, has a, a situation where I think Sundays they don't allow people to use lawnmowers and, and those devices. And, and, and other countries, so you have, um, you know, and some people, they say they have a quiet space. So even within a city, certain hours, people may they say like between 12 and 2, quiet space where you're not going to get noise that people could get at peace. So this is things we need to look at if it's on the agenda. I think member, yeah, so. Yeah. Just for completeness, um, and I guess it would inform perhaps of some of our recommendations, would the TTPS support the, instead of acquiring more of those monitors and so on, would you all support a shift in the responsibility for enforcing noise levels away from the TTPS towards um, because I think the question was put out there was the EMA, a separate agency, whether it be the EMA, municipal um, corporations or whatever, um, given the amount of serious crime that, you know, you yeah. are also tasked um, dealing with, would you support that um, a movement away um, from the TTPS and empower some other agency to not make arrests but... Um, issue tickets and, and impose fines and penalties for breaches of noise levels and to do the actual monitoring and enforcement of those rules. To the chair, we would totally support that, ma'am. Okay, thank you. Member Hislop. Just a, a quick question. Um, in other jurisdictions, we have, um, I know in Trinidad and Tobago, we have any day, any time as it relates to bars opening. Um, I don't know if the officials who are here would, I know our culture in Trinidad and Tobago, and sometimes what we need is a culture change. Mm -hmm. I don't know if the officials here will support recommendations to the point that you have a cutoff time for bars, as in some other jurisdictions. Because in some jurisdictions, when it gets to 2, 2 a.m., mm -hmm. No more alcohol is sold at bars, and bars are closed at 2 a.m. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I, you hear the, the, the old phrase, last call, that was a, that's, that's a real thing, that this is the last call we close off at 2 a.m., and I think it may assist um, with the noise situation in some communities where bars and karaoke areas want to run till 4 and 5 o'clock in the morning. So, Chairman? Yes, yes. And again, it will help productivity. People go home earlier, they sleep earlier, and they, they go to work. Yes, yes. A, a question for the EMA. In your submissions, you stated that the code, there's a code um, that you have currently available on the EMA's website. So given that the Trinidad and Tobago Promoters Association in their submission to the committee dated March 31st, 2023, indicated that they were not aware of the code and, and what other, so what other media has the EME utilized to ensure that all stakeholders are aware of the code? Well, Chairman, we actually had a meeting um, with the Promoters Association in last year when? In, in, in July last year, and we, we, we brought them up to date in terms of the code and everything else. So we, we, we we're trying to meet with, with, with persons and, I mean, um, um, I mean, make them aware of the website and all other resources that are available with respect to dealing with noise pollution. Yeah, sure, because we were a bit, you know, they're, they're claiming that they don't know and, the code of and, practice. And so. I'm, I'm just <laughs> been, I've just been reminded that in all the noise variations, we also refer to it. So it's one of the, the conditions and the variations where you have uh, We'll have to question them on, <laughs> on that, yeah. And so. Does any other member have any questions they would like to pose? No? Good, all right. So at this stage, um, I think we had a, a fruitful um, morning, a lot of information was sent and given, and new information, new things we could look at. So 
I would now um, like to ask the Mr. Hayden Ramona to please give us some brief closing comments. And, and I've been told to make it short. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Chair, members, uh, thank you. I mean, this was a really productive morning. Um, and we look forward to um, the continuation of this, of this conversation because noise, we all are aware, is a serious nuisance in our country, which need to be treated with. Um, again, Chair, thank you and members, and, um, and I look forward to further deliberations um, to deal and treat with the scourge of noise. Thank, thank you, you, Mr. Romano. Would Ms. Mary Hines now give us brief closing comments? I would also say on behalf of the Ministry of Planning and Development that this has been quite a productive and interesting session from our perspective. Uh, we thank you for um, the level of detail that we were able to pursue and um, look forward to being part of the team that closes some of those gaps and facilitates and supports new approaches to addressing this issue of noise pollution. So we thank you. Thank you. Mr. Collis Hazel. Thank you very much. And on that, I would like to as well say that the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service is indeed um, happy to be a part um, and to collaborate with the, this tripartite arrangement that we have been to in working in terms of dealing with noise. Um, we. The, the session this morning and throughout the we really learned a lot and we are appreciative of the importance. Clearly in this in society we have noted the noise as a concern based on the records of re complaints and reports available to us. And we are prepared to work with the team including all the others who have been noted that are absent in order to ensure that we mitigate these instances outside there that are troubling to society. And we look forward to working in collaboration in solving these problems within the Trinidad and Tobago space. Thank you, Mr. Hazel. So again, it's really for the persons out there to get some sort of relief. And I think we are all combining our efforts to try and see if we can give them that relief. And the next hearing we'll be having next month actually was for some stakeholders who would come on board and give us some of their um, uh, instances. We'll be having the, who are we having again? The, the noise pollution some group, the NGOs. NGOs. Some NGOs will be coming on board as well as the promoters. So again, we'll be hearing some, you know, some of their concerns also. So at this stage, I would like to thank officials of the Environmental Management Authority, the Ministry of Planning and Development, and the Tobago, Trinidad and Tobago Police Service for your contribution in today's hearing. I would like to thank my committee members and the staff of the Office of the Parliament uh, for your procedural and logistical support, and the viewing and the listening audience. I now declare this meeting adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>